Uh, and our history of contributions in the area of climate change. Uh, the, the National Academy of Sciences was established uh, by Congress uh, and signed into law by President uh, Lincoln in 1863. Uh, and, and the purpose of the academies was to advise the nation on issues of science, engineering, and medicine. Uh, we're private, non-governmental, uh, non-partisan, non-profit institutions that uh, now constitutes three academies, the, Acad the National Academy of Sciences, the National Academy of Engineering, and the National Academy of Medicine, as well as the operating arm of the three academies, which we refer to as the National Academies. Uh, uh, together, we marshal the nation's critical thinkers to provide expert advice on some of the most pressing challenges facing the nation and the world. Our work helps shape sound policy, inform public opinion, wow, that's, <laughs> and advance the pursuit of science, engineering, and medicine. Uh, each of the three academies and the National Academies as a whole uh, um, undertake important work related to climate change. And the three presidents have joined together uh, uh, to call for action in addressing climate change. And you'll have a chance to hear from the three presidents in our next panel. Uh, today, our, our, most of our, our programmatic work here at the academies is carried out by, by seven program divisions, which range from uh, behavioral and social sciences and education, earth and life studies, engineering and physical sciences, transportation research, policy and global affairs, health and medicine, and, and the Gulf Research Program. All of our divisions, each, each of these divisions has multiple boards and other activities that carry out studies, convene workshops, organize roundtables, and, and other activities. Um, um, and all of the divisions have programs and activities related to climate change. And later today, at the end of this afternoon session, you'll have a chance to to meet with, learn more about these activities and meet the staff of, the, of our program divisions responsible for that work. The, the academies are probably best known for our consensus study reports. And here I've just uh, shown a few examples of the, the work that we've done on climate change over the decades. Uh, the first starting on the, on the left-hand side, uh, the Charney report, uh, which was released in 1979, uh, provided the first estimate of the amount of warming that would be expected from a doubling of CO2 in the, in the atmosphere. And this estimate of what is now referred to as climate sensitivity has been upheld by research over the last 40 years. Uh, another report, uh, Climate Change Science, which was released in 2001, uh, and this was a, in response to a request from President George W. Bush. And this report provided a roadmap and, and guidance on climate research priorities for the Bush administration. Uh, the report in the middle, America's Climate Choices, is a series of reports that the academies did between 2009 and 2011 uh, in response to a congressional mandate. This activity convened hundreds of experts and other stakeholders and resulted in a series of reports, uh, one on the science of climate change, other reports on laying out options for mitigation and adaptation and for informing decision-making. And then more recently, uh, a negative emissions technologies report from 2019, which provided a roadmap uh, for carbon removal and reliable sequestration. And, and finally, accelerating decarbonization of the US energy system uh, which was released in 2021, uh, which provided critical input for efforts to advance the energy transition. And this study is actually, we're wrapping up a second report from this committee 
uh, which will be released in, in the next few months. And so these are just a few, uh, a small sampling of our work related to climate change over the years. Uh, recognizing the increased urgency of the climate crisis and the expanding breadth of work that we were doing within the academies, this year uh, we made a decision to launch a new initiative, which we're calling Climate Crossroads. And Climate Crossroads will serve as a nexus point within the National Academies, taking a new approach to facilitate and increase collaboration on climate work and allowing us to chart new pathways for sustained national and, and global leadership over the coming decades. Climate Crossroads will provide high level coordination for strategies to support existing activities, to launch new ex activities across the divisions and to connect us with new partners. This new in initiative is being run out of my office to ensure that we leverage the full capacity of the National Academies. And we're, we're really excited to explore new ways to work with partners to drive toward impact and to catalyze action. I'm, I'm really pleased uh, to, that, that Amanda Stout will be directing this new initiative. Amanda has more than 15 years uh, experience at the National Academies, including serving as the director of the, our Board on Atmospheric Sciences and Climate and the Polar Research Board for the last 10 years. And Amanda and her team have done a terrific job planning this event. And, and I'll now invite her to, to, to provide, to, uh, to come up and provide an overview of our plans for the summit. So, Amanda. Do I need this one? No. All right. Thank you so much, Greg. Um, I am really excited to lead this new initiative and um, I'm really excited for the dialogue that we're gonna have here today at the summit. You know, we were very intentional in um, choosing to call this new initiative Climate Crossroads. Um, you know, crossroads are places where people come together, where historically there's been an exchange of ideas that's enabled uh, societal advances and new understandings. And I think climate, uh, addressing the climate crisis uh, requires just that. And um, we need to bring together the breadth of disciplines, of sectors, cultures, stakeholders, perspectives, ideas that are needed to generate insights and make progress. That's what we hope to do here with the Climate Crossroads Initiative um, and what we aim for this event to embody. Um, we've tried to organize the agenda in a way to enable uh, panel discussions and conversation to have an exchange of ideas. Um, and we've included a lot of time for networking and building collaboration. Um, so um, before we continue with the program today, I'd first like to do some thank yous. Um, I'd like to acknowledge um, that the National Academy of Sciences building where we are gathered here uh, in person in Washington, DC is physically located on the traditional land of the Nakachetank and Piscataway peoples past and present. Um, we honor with gratitude the land itself and the people who have been its stewards throughout the generations. Um, we honor and respect the enduring relationships that exist between these people and nations and this land and acknowledge that the expertise held by different native communities is crucial to the work of understanding and addressing climate change. I would also like to thank everyone who has helped to make this event possible. Our sponsors, the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation and the Arthur L. Day Fund of the National Academy of Sciences. Um, the leadership, Greg and the presidents and others in the leadership at the academies have been incredibly um, supportive and provided great advice. And as we've been, we've been thinking about how to pull this together. Um, we have had so many um, uh, advisors over the last several years that have um, been incredibly helpful. Our climate crossroads planning team, our uh, climate communications in initiative advisory committee. I've talked to dozens of boards and other advisory committees over the last several years who have all given just an incredibly thoughtful advice and support. Um, and so really uh, appreciate all, all of that that's gone into our thinking. Um, there is a, a whole crew of staff who've been working hard to pull this together. I really wanted to highlight Amanda Purcell who's took the lead in putting this event together. Thank you so much, Amanda.
Amanda on Friday accepted an offer to be the Associate Director of the Climate Crossroads Initiative, and we're super excited to have her on board. Um, Um, and I wanted to give a shout out to Rita Gaskins, who handled all of the logistics for this event. Um, she's out; she was out at the registration table. So, um, but also someone you can ask go to with any questions um, as we go through the next few days. At the end of the event, I will thank all of the other people. There are so many; it would take a long time to get through all of them. But just really wanted to call out those two. Um, and then finally, thanks to all of our facilitators and panelists. I'm really excited about this agenda, and I can't wait to hear all of the conversations. All right, so I have a little bit of housekeeping before we get going. Um, we are committed to fostering a professional, respectful, inclusive environment where all participants, both in person and virtual, can participate fully in an atmosphere that is free of harassment and discrimination based on any identity-based factors. Um, the National Academy's policies can be found on our website. Um, if you experience or witness behaviors that appear to violate this code of conduct, please uh, notify us immediately. Um, oh, you go one back. There we go. Um, in um, For those of you in person, if there's an emergency, you can exit through the door that you entered um, in the middle of the auditorium here. There are a few major exits, but the easiest thing to do is head straight across um, and uh, continue straight through the Great Hall and, and out the exit onto Constitution Avenue. Um, the restrooms are marked in blue here. If you exit the auditorium, you can turn right for the facilities that are near the C Street entrance, or you can go into the Great Hall and make a left um, for those that are opposite the East Court. All right, so I'm gonna walk quickly through the agenda. I know we're already a little behind. Um, we, as I mentioned, we've set this up as a series of facilitated conversations um, along with audience Q&A. Um, we want to engage everyone in the conversation. So please, please join us in that. Um, we have a lot of folks registered online. Welcome all of you into the conversation as well. All of the panel discussions, those that are in the, in the uh, brighter blue color um, will be live streamed. We will also be using Slido to get questions from our virtual participants. Um, and for those of you online, you'll see a box just below the live stream where you can sign in and input questions. Those of you here in the room, you can also uh, join the Slido and uh, enter your questions there if you would like. Um, we will be have an opportunity for folks to come to the microphone in the room and ask questions. And our staff will be coming up and asking questions that have been upvoted on Slido. So we get a mixture of those from in-person and online. Um, closed captioning is enabled on the video stream. So you can click the CC button in the lower right portion of the video to see the captions. Um, and then let me just highlight at the end of the day today where um, I'm, I'm gonna be back up here and gonna give a really quick overview of some of the activities that are happening around the academies. Um, and then we're gonna invite those of you in person to join us for um, a showcase and reception where staff from the academies have um, uh, set up tables and will be available to chat with you about the kind of work that they're doing. Okay, lastly, just to note that the live stream is being recorded and the video will be available soon, if not immediately after the event concludes. All right, so that's all the housekeeping. And with that, I am excited um, to get underway. I'd like to invite Peter Frumhoff, um, who will be um, uh, facilitating our first panel and our uh, three presidents to join me here on the stage and we will get underway. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. Welcome, everybody. Good morning. Uh, my name is Peter Fremhoff. I'm the Senior Science Policy Advisor at the Woodwell Climate Research Center in Woods Hole. I teach at Harvard University. I'm also a member of the Board on Atmospheric Sciences and Climate here at the National Academies. At a moment in time in which extreme heat uh, and flooding uh, is intensifying both across the US and internationally, when global temperature records are being shattered, uh, we are clearly at a crossroads uh, in our national and global response uh, to climate change. I could not be more pleased than to be able to moderate this morning's panel. Uh, and I look forward to a rich discussion now and over the next two days. Let me start by introducing each of our distinguished panelists. 
We have Marsha McNutt, President of the National Academy of Sciences, John Anderson, President of the National Academy of Engineering, and Victor Tsao, President of the National Academy of Medicine, and Amanda Stout, who you've just met as the Director of the new Climate Crossroads Initiative here at the Academies. This morning, we'll discuss the need, the challenges, the opportunities to bring research across many disciplines together to address the climate crisis, and to discuss how the three academies are working together to accelerate essential and actionable cross-disciplinary work on climate. We'll also leave plenty of time for Q&A uh, with the audience. So Marshall, let me start with you. The National Academies have a long and storied history of bringing science to bear across disciplines to have impact at national and global levels. Um, could you say a little bit about how what you see as the key challenges and opportunities in harnessing the breadth of expertise needed to address the climate crisis? Uh, yes, Peter, sure. Thank you for that question. And first of all, uh, welcome from me to all our people who are here in the auditorium and our online audience. I, I don't think we could be meeting at a more important time. Wildfires in Canada, I mean, honestly, floods in Vermont, you turn on the news and we're constantly being overwhelmed by all of these climate emergencies and climate fueled natural disasters. So um, I'm by background, a geoscientist. So for much of my career, I've been involved in the climate issue uh, going back uh, many decades. But I have to say that about 10 years ago, I was very concerned that as geoscientists, we were putting a finer and finer point on how bad this climate crisis was going to become and what some of the implications would be. And yet so little was being done about it. So uh, I was invited, as I say, about 10 years ago to give a union lecture at the American Geophysical Union meeting on any topic I wanted to talk about. Well, at the time, the real buzzword in um, biomedical research was convergence. And it occurred to me that convergence was exactly what we needed to embrace in the geosciences in order to address this climate emergency. So in that talk that uh, I gave at the AGU, I talked about the importance of geoscientists reaching out to other disciplines, um, to the biomedical community. Because of course, one of the best ways to encourage people to take action is to talk about it in terms of their personal health and how that will be impacted by climate change. We needed to reach out to engineering because after all, engineering, new technology was going to be the source of many of the solutions but also currently was the source of much of the problems. And then of course we needed to reach out to the social scientists in order to understand what is actually gonna motivate people to take action and what are some of the foibles that we have as human beings that are preventing us from acting to a slow motion crisis. Um, after I got here uh, to the academy, um, I started working with people here, including Amanda, to try to bring this convergent type framework um, to, to the climate crisis, hence uh, the climate crossroads, which will involve our transportation research board, because after all, transportation is one of the biggest contributors to climate change, and it can be one of our best approaches to reducing our carbon footprint and uh, DEPS, our Division of, of Engineering and Physical Sciences. Uh, that's where we're going to find a lot of solutions. And of course, DBAS, where the social sciences and HMD medical and our uh, policy and global affairs group, because this is a global problem and we have to work internationally on it. And just in closing, I'll say, we're even going um, as far as the National Academy of Sciences to try to take a more convergent approach, even in how we engage with our members. Um, like many other groups, we are we elect members in disciplines, 
that are very siloed in the election process. But now we're starting to set up affinity groups. And our first affinity group is actually in the area of agriculture and climate change. Because agriculture right now is, we're concerned that it's at a tipping point. That too many of the crops that we depend on today to feed the world are operating within a very narrow range of productivity. And as temperature changes and rainfall changes, we are not prepared for how that is going to affect crops, including pests, pests that previously couldn't even survive a Midwest winter, and now they can. So there's so much to be done in the ag space. And I think this will just be the first of many affinity groups um, on climate change. Uh, you know, climate change and um, demand for critical minerals, uh, climate change and um, human health, which is uh, another part of this. So uh, frankly, I think this convergent approach is what we need to take in order to get real action. Thanks so much, Marcia. So John, let me turn to you and let's pick up on this concept of convergence and think about the role of technological and engineering approaches connecting to other disciplines and other communities of expertise uh, to, you know, to, to address both and accelerate the transition uh, to net zero emissions, but also to think about the, their, their role in sort of Marsha was also alluding to supporting greater climate resilience and adaptation. Can you share your take on the importance of those connections and what the engineering community needs to bring to bear? Yes, thank you. Uh, before I do that, I'd like to uh, acknowledge the contribution by Amanda and her staff. This uh, idea didn't come overnight. I think the first email I got about it was over three years ago. So this is a, a drive. Amanda's a great salesperson. She's a scientist. And all of us in academia know that to do good research, you have to be a good salesperson because you got to get people to support it. So she got us to support it. So I want to congratulate you and your staff because you did a fantastic job and he's going behind you. Um, the, I agree with the uh, uh, climate crossways is extensive. I spent my career in academia and sectors bring together all parts, can bring together all parts of the university. Uh, they don't usually grant degrees, but they convene and they uh, the various pieces. And Marcia touched on that before in convergence. Uh, here. There's, I view uh, the climate uh, challenges as two pieces. One is the what, I mean, uh, the scientists have really laid out the strong uh, support for um, anthropogenic causes of uh, climate change and got us all on board, really. And what is the, are the models and uh, the scenarios if you know, we do something, or even if we do some things. Engineering is really about the how, how do we get there? And that's the real, the real challenge for, for, for us for, and for humanity. Uh, there's technological challenges, there's systems challenges, this is system systems, and uh, there are social challenges. Something that I don't think engineering has paid enough attention to is social awareness of how we do things. Uh, so the, the, the how is, is what we're interested in. And uh, as Peter, you alluded to before, there's uh, a great deal, and Amanda, a great deal of work has been done on, on addressing uh, understanding and addressing climate change over the years. This report on uh, decarbonization, I think is very influential. It shows, it gives us some pathways to achieve the zero net carbon uh, emissions, uh, not easy. Uh, the, a recent one just came out was laying the foundations for advanced nuclear reactors. I personally don't think we have a chance to get to where we wanna be in 2050 unless we can do something with nuclear in addition to renewables uh, uh, and, and electrification of the, of the country. So uh, this report, if you haven't seen it, laying the foundation for advanced nuclear reactors is really very good. And we will be working hard on disseminating it and be part of the, the um, showpiece of the uh, uh, crossroads, the climate crossroads. Um, in the technologies to decarbonize, it, it, two two main ideas have come out. Uh, one is that we can decarbonize. There's seven, about seventy five percent of the um, energy usage we can relatively easily decarbonize. It costs some money, but we know how to 
do those things. Uh, if we have the commitment to do it, uh, then there's 25% that's more difficult. What are the most difficult things? Aviation, uh, long-term shipping over, over land and sea, uh, and manufacturing, which accounts for something like 19, 20% of the energy usage in the United States. Uh, I know when I was, uh, you know, we teach a chemical, I'm a chemical engineer, you teach a uh, course in uh, design and let's say heat exchangers or a piece of equipment in a, in a process, you just say heat, Q, you know, you don't say where it comes from, where you're gonna get it, how you're gonna use it and so on. So I think we need a, a revamping of how we, uh, we actually teach uh, process design. Um, so uh, recently uh, in our uh, recent issue of the bridge, uh, the whole issue is devoted to, to the transition to zero carbon in processing and in, in residential and so on. And I think it's a really good uh, advise you to take a, take a look at that. But that came about also at the urging of uh, the Climate Crossroads, a piece that Amanda worked with the, the editor of, the, of that journal, bridge and uh, that the people involved that had to be involved. Uh, finally, uh, uh, in terms of education, I touched on this briefly. I'm a chemical engineer, as I said, and uh, there's a, a new study that came out about the future of chemical engineering and it focused on education. And I think uh, we have to pay more attention to it. The people that are gonna solve uh, our problems are not probably not in the audience today. And uh, we need to be teaching education uh, the importance of looking at what we're doing to the atmosphere and the climate and the environment in general when we create things. And so this report that came out, it's, it's different because it emphasized all those, those uh, things I mentioned and how education should bring in, not just in engineering, but also in science, should bring in uh, our, the need to uh, consider uh, the environment and sustainability. Adaptation is a big area for engineering as well, because we know that even if we stop putting CO2 in the atmosphere, there's still going to be some things happening, as you mentioned, Peter, and uh, you see level rise. And uh, I think um, uh, we have a board on environmental uh, infrastructure and constructive environment, we have a board on engineering and uh, on, um, energy and uh, 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 environmental systems. We have other boards. This is, the, this is the strength of the crossroads. We can bring these boards together bring and convene. The, the power of the academies is convening experts, both in the national academies and out, outside the national academies. So the climate, the climate crossroads can really help us in convening people we need uh, to address the problems, some of which are yet to be exposed. So I'm very positive on this initiative. I thank you again, Amanda. I think we... Uh, we can do it. Very positive uh, that we can make an impact through the national academies, and uh, we'll see what happens. But <laughs> great, thank you, John. So, Victor, to you, uh -huh. some of really important convergent work is already being done uh, in the national academies of medicine through what you've called the grand challenge on climate change, human health, and equity. That's been in operation, as I understand it, for more than a year now. Could you say a little bit, maybe, to make this tangible, to bring this down home about that program and What's, who's involved and what impact you're seeking to have? Thank you, Peter. And I too join uh, Marsha and uh, John and congratulate Amanda and Greg for putting this together. Certainly it's great for me to be sitting here along with the other academies talk about convergence because it is what it's all about. Um, so from a medicine point of view, I'm, I know that all of you care about your health. And had you realized that climate is not only about, you know, the environment, the future generations, but also yourself, you realize very quickly that something needs to be done and there's a sense of urgency. So that's what we got, how we got into this, because when you look at the data, it's really quite astounding. Uh, globally, over 20 million people are dying from climate related issues, extreme weather, famine, drought, you name it, right? And uh, so this is a big deal. And there's, you know, as you know, there's you know, climate uh, migrants, you name it. And United States, we're not immune from this. A lot of people are dying from air pollution, hundreds of thousands. 
and from extreme weather that Masha talked about. And of course, you all seen in television, the human toll that it takes on. So when we talk about all these things, I just want to shine a light on the human toll, what you care about. And this is why we got involved because, you know, when we first started, this is about four years ago in this area, uh, not a lot of people talk about climate change and human health, right? They talk about, you know, you see a picture of a polar bear on the shrinking slab of ice, but very few pictures show you the human suffering that come from climate change. And consequently, we decided something needs to be done. <clears throat> now, the good news we believe is the profession, the medical profession is still very trusted with high level of trust. So we figure we've got to be messengers to the public, to every patient, others, for them to wear. It's not just the future, it's happening right now. And therefore we need something about this. Likewise, for our health professionals, we need to understand this because we contribute in fact, to the carbon emission in many ways I'll talk about later. So we want to, all our health professional educators, so introducing curriculum to medical school, nursing school, you name it. But I think the real important issue is how to pull this together. And Peter mentioned the grand challenge. So we had a whole bunch of planning committees about three and a half, four years ago, which resulted in launching the grand challenge two years ago. We call it a grand challenge because as born from engineering, it requires everybody, bold ideas to work together. So our grand challenge is a public-private partnership. It's not just health, but disciplines in engineering and other sciences. It's not just about the academia, but we in fact have involved private sectors, industry, government, et cetera. In fact, uh, Rachel Levine, the Assistant Secretary of Health, co-chairs a decarbonization of healthcare with me, among others who are major leaders in biomedical, uh, pharmaceutical device companies, et cetera. We're working together. So what is the grand challenge? We identify five areas that we should work with, along, of course, with the discipline that you heard about convergence. One's communication. I talked about that already. We work with climate... Uh, a communication initiative to look at this, but we're also with a lot of people to make sure this message is out there uh, and that people are more eager to act. A uh, second area is in fact, what we call the roadmap, which is truly convergent because Judy Roden, who's the former president of Rockefeller, chairs this grand challenge and the roadmap. The idea is to say, you know, when you look at all the things that Marsha and John talked about and all the sectors, most of their work is looking vertically on terms of consumption and emission and how do we reduce it, how do we mitigate it. Rarely they talk about what is it doing to health. So we decided what we need to bring together is all these sectors with a lens about human health and human well-being. So agriculture, transportation, energy, water, and of course, health sector, and you name it. So by coming together, we call this systems transformation. We want to create a macroeconomic model that focuses on human well-being uh, versus just emission alone. That's the second. Third is decarbonize the U.S. health sector. You know, the, the health sector emits 4.5% of global emission globally. But if you take U.S., Canada, U.K., Australia, these countries together rank number six when we're independent country in the emission. So I'm talking about the healthcare sector now. US alone, we emit 8.5% of total uh, greenhouse emission in the US. It's huge. And as a physician, mm -hmm. aside from saying, let's make sure they're healthy, we want to do no harm. It's a Hippocratic oath. So we therefore, we may talk more about this, mobilize a lot of people to look at how can we act together. We're now in the midst of actually starting a campaign, a movement with all the health sectors across the country, as well as supply chain industry to set goals to decarbonize. So that's great. Third area, a fourth area is research innovation because we clearly recognize that you need this research innovation. 
just I think back on the days when I earlier days in terms of how to improve healthcare, and there was a lot of innovative issues, even in frontline workers. We want every frontline worker to think about how to reduce carbon emission and how to change the way we deliver care. More virtual care, much less driving to a hospital. I was just in Boston driving on Longwood, I'm sorry. It took me half an hour to go from one, one end of Longwood to the other. And so there are lots of things we can do. And then finally, equity. Uh, I want to emphasize, and I'm going to stop at, at this, equity is a really important issue. If you look at globally, the low-income countries have five times more in climate impact, and yet they emit the least. And so there's a tremendous global inequity. But in our country, all you have to do is look at what's happening with the extreme events, et cetera, and, uh, you know, uh, Katrina, you name it, marginalized and poor neighborhoods are much more affected by climate environment. So equity is an important issue. So our last one is to get together communities and lived experience along with what we call strategic partners to design what we can do in the issue of more vulnerable communities. So this is what we're working on, but I am truly privileged to be on stage with my co-presidents to work on this very issue and Amanda yourself as well. Thank you so much, Victor. So Amanda, let's turn to you. Here we are at the launch of the Climate Crossroads Initiative. You've been incubating this for some time now with lots of input from others, as you mentioned, from the academies and, and, and beyond. Tell us what you're most excited about, what, what, what you see as new, what's different, what are you looking forward to? Oh, thank you, Peter. And, and thank you for all the kind words. It's really, it really means a lot to me. Um, so when we started talking about this and in Marsha's challenge about applying convergence to climate, um, which makes a lot of sense, but also is a big challenge to think about how do you do that in an institution like ours, which has been around for 160 <laughs> 60. years, thank you, <laughs> um, and um, is, you know, has well-established um, boards and approaches to doing our work. Um, so we're organized kind of like a university with something like 80 different programmatic units that are working in different disciplinary areas. That provides us an amazing reach in terms of the connection with all of these disciplinary experts and the communities of stakeholders and um, audiences that are interested in their work. Um, the challenge is how do you bring those groups together to do work that falls at their interfaces? And often and in other institutions face the same challenges, those kinds of problems that fall at the intersections um, can fall through the cracks. Um, so, you know, an important thing that we wanted to think about is how do we um, incentivize uh, new programmatic work that falls at those intersections um, and how do we figure out ways to support it? And we've done some of that work over the last few years, the, the report on negative emissions technologies that uh, looked at carbon dioxide removal and sequestration. We brought together seven or eight boards to work on that, that the energy board, the chemistry board, the agriculture board, um, the, chem, um, and the board that I was directing, the board on atmospheric sciences and climate. And that work was incredibly impactful, also really hard to get started. <laughs> it was like a big lift to get that project going. Um, and so uh, one of the things that we're doing with the Climate Crossroads is identifying some of these areas that fall at the interface where we want to be intentional about bringing together the different parts of the academies to make progress. We're really inspired by the work that Victor and the National Academy of Medicine have done on his grand challenge, where he said, here is a societal problem that we wanna go after, and we want to leverage and bring to bear the capacity of our institution to address that problem. We think we can do that for other areas as well. So we've identified what we're calling uh, four of these pathways to action. I've, we've we've in, embedded the, the grand challenge as the first of those pathways, and we're delighted that uh, to be working together on that. Um, the second one, the second pathway to action that we've identified is around accelerating decarbonization, building on the body of work that our board on energy and environmental systems has already been leading. Um, and as, as Greg mentioned in his opening remarks, uh, they released a big report about two years ago and have another one that's about to come out. Um, and they're interested in sustaining that engagement over the decades it's going to take for us to accomplish the energy transition. 
Um, the third of these pathways to action is around thriving uh, ecosystems in the context of a changing climate. Um, we have a lot of work, a lot, much of it within our Division on Earth and Life Studies, that's looked at various aspects of, of the environment, um, impacts on water and ocean and forests, et cetera. But we haven't had a single way to bring that all together into a coherent portfolio of work. And when we think about ecosystems and climate change, we both have to think about how is climate change affecting those ecosystems? How is it adding to the other kinds of stresses that ecosystems are already facing? And increasingly, we're thinking about ecosystems as part of the solution to climate change, as a place that can store carbon. And we need to think about those together. Um, Marsha also mentioned agriculture. We also are looking at our managed ecosystems to feed the human population. And that, that's a pretty hard set of problems to try to address. Um, so the second of these pathways to action where we're, we're focusing effort to build out work is around uh, these uh, thriving ecosystems in a context of a changing climate. And then the fourth one is around um, climate resilient communities. Um, and, and this is recognizing that so much of the action and the work to address climate change is going to need to happen at a community scale. And we need to think hard and there's a lot of work that needs to go into figuring out how to bring science, engineering, medicine, other kinds of um, insights to those kind of community scale decision-making. And I'm really excited that our Division on Behavioral and Social Sciences and Education will be um, spearheading uh, that pathway and working with colleagues from across the academies to help us think through what we can do to um, advance work around communities. The other piece of the Climate Crossroads, which is new, is that you know, we need to think broadly about who are the actors um, and who are our audiences for the work that the National Academies has, does. Traditionally, and, and, and to this day, a lot of our work is um, sponsored by, requested by the US federal government, an important stakeholder um, in addressing the climate crisis. And we will continue to be working with the US government and to support the decision-making in the federal government. And addressing climate change requires a whole suite of other kinds of actors, um, uh, philanthropy, uh, private industry, um, communities, in, uh, international groups. There is a whole host of other stakeholders that need to be involved in, in helping uh, move forward uh, to address climate change. So part of what we're looking to do in the climate crossroads is really open the aperture in terms of who we're talking to, to understand what are the science, engineering, and medicine needs of a broader suite of, of, of actors who need to be involved in addressing the climate change, climate crisis, and also thinking about how the work that we do can be um, uh, connected and delivered and, and shared with those audiences in a way that's more useful for them. Um, so a, a lot of the Climate Crossroads is kind of building those kinds of relationships, exploring those kinds of partnerships, and thinking about how we can make our work have a broader reach and impact. Great, thanks so much. So we're going to open this up more of a conversation now and <laughs> open up remarks. I want, to, I want to pick up first on, Victor, where you talked about communicating uh, yeah. with key audiences, and Amanda, you spoke to that as well. Uh, recognizing that the audiences, the academies needs to reach go well beyond Congress and federal agencies, and, and the Crossroads provides a real opportunity to think new and in and, and, and a fresh way about, about reaching various audiences, about communication. Uh, you know, not, not enough just to have the scientific and technical expertise, but to communicate it effectively. So the challenge of communicating, of cutting through the noise, of meeting folks where they are is daunting, especially in the moment in which we're in with social media and all the complicating uh, distractions of where people get information. It sometimes can feel overwhelming. I'd love to hear from each of you about what, what you think the academies, including through Climate Scrum Crossroads, uh, can do most effectively to communicate on climate in this moment. So Marsha, let me start with you. Um, sure, so Peter, if I had to say what I think is the greatest hurdle we're gonna face as an institution is um, we're kind of a hammer and thus everything looks like a nail. And um, the way the academies of course have had impact in the past is to do consensus reports. And this is really not an issue in which just putting out consensus reports is gonna get us where we need to be. 
I think we need to think a lot more creatively about giving people toolkits that actually, um, first of all, assure them that the science behind it is solid. So they're not gonna be investing in some sort of intervention that in the end, people will turn around and say, well, that didn't have any impact. And of course, a, a case history of that is carbon credits. You know, there, there's so much um, snake oil out there in the carbon credit uh, department that um, this is one area where I think we could provide some guidance and so, some more certainty about investments that will actually have impact. But then in these toolkits, providing vetted ways to success for uh, industry, for example, um, what can they invest in that actually will be um, solving the problem will be affordable, um, that will be impactful, and that won't have unintended consequences. So I think that's what we really have to work on right now. And we're going to need a lot of input from these different audiences, from industry, from state and local government. This is where so much of the really important climate action is taking place today. And yet this has always been a challenge for us because of the fact that we're a fairly small institution and there are so many jurisdictions out there with their own problems. We have to get to them where they are. We have to understand what their issues are and provide them with help so that they can be part of the solution. Thank you so much, Marsha. John, do you want to speak to the communication challenges from an Oh, yes, I think it's critical. It's been estimated that uh, two to three trillion dollars will have to be spent per year for the next 30 years to really get to where we want to be. And that will take political will uh, and government will. And uh, you can't reach everybody individually, but as I've heard in the past, that we want to influence the influencers. So we have to get to the right people who can influence the public and the government, influence the influencers on this. So that's one critical thing. I think the second one is we have to really impress upon the business community that we're all in this together and they're going to have to work on it as well. So uh, blaming business is not going to work. We have to work together with that people. And uh, business is, is always going to be a, a, a critical part of it. So those would be the two things I think uh, we, that we should focus on. Victor. Communication, I mentioned earlier about communication. <laughs> the question is, who's our audience? So I think we have several audiences and certainly from my point of view, Academy shouldn't shy away from those audiences, not our usual lane. So first of all, it's the public, right? Public sentiments are really important in terms of driving changes. And that's why we keep on thinking, if we were to focus on their health, well-being, human toll and human life, et cetera. And using our experience in public health, um, tobacco, auto, mobile safety, uh, HIV AIDS, we can utilize that kind of approach, public health approach, because we say this is a public health crisis. I don't think anybody would disagree with that, right? Second is that we need to think about how to, in fact, engage the policy decision makers. And that's really important because at the end of the day, we want them to be able to make the right policy, right? And what we've learned is that you can't show data all the time. Marsh is right about evidence, but you know, your eyes glaze over. But if you work in Congress, you know that storytelling narratives are so important. So we're really using a combination of what they call a mixed approach of narratives and data. That's key. Getting, in fact, the life experience, as I said, people who have gone through this, being able to talk about this, and also importantly, being able to bring together that data. So when you think about talking to policymakers, you know, I mean, what do they care about, right? They care about the fact that this is gonna be good for their citizen. They care about the fact that uh, they can look good, have good legacy. So we should really provide them with a positive outlook, not just negative all the time. It's terrible, it's terrible, terrible. 
But look what you can do if you mitigate this and have some real data that can give them some wins. And then finally, I think John's point about all of us communicating together. And our work in collaborate with Grand Challenge, at least 50% of our people, maybe 30% are from private sector. You know, major pharmaceutical companies, AstraZeneca, GSK, device company, the Medtronic, supply chain and lines. And they're all saying, okay, we get it. Now with potential ESG ruling on, in fact, reporting, and of course the whole issue, uh, pardon me, uh, SEC, and the whole issue of ESG in companies, they are talking about this. So they really need to join us to say, let's do it together because we need to learn from each other. How do you measure, how do you report, et cetera. So I think those are the elements of communication, really important for the public to understand this, really important to get the voice of those who are suffering and really important to show evidence. Thanks so much. I, the notion of the Academy is really thinking uh, in new ways about combining data and narrative. Uh, going well beyond the consensus report format is really important and exciting. And being somewhat optimistic instead of always pessimistic too. <laughs> That's interesting. I'd love to hear more about that. Let me first turn to, to, to Amanda though, in the context of the Climate Crossroads Initiative and the other work the academies have been doing to communicate on climate change over the last couple of years. Say a little more about both where you see the foundation and platform that you're building through the initiative. It's interesting that you highlighted narrative because one of the um, main communications things that we launched over the last two and a half years is the Climate Conversations webinar series. And hopefully many of you in the audience have um, joined and listened in to some. And I know there's some folks who've participated in that series over the last couple of years. And so when we were starting to put that together, we wanted to have a platform to um, talk about what was in our reports and what was going on in science after long after a report had been released. We do a lot of work right when a report comes out, but often those issues are still relevant and pertinent for quite a while. And so part of what we wanted to do is have a way to kind of continue to engage around the work. Um, and we thought about, well, maybe we should invite talks by um, experts and have slides and kind of do a more traditional kind of uh, presentations. And, and we actually moved away from that to more of a narrative conversational style. So those webinars, if you haven't participated, they involve a facilitated discussion with two experts who share about their personal journey to why they got interested in the topic and why they are working on it. Um, they talk about the, the topic and, and, and the latest science and they engage with audience on the questions. And I think that you know, you know, approach of trying to really um, um, kind of humanize the, the, the science and the, 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 you know, these are hard topics that we're working on and really approach it as a, as a conversation and a dialogue is really central to how we're thinking about the climate crossroads. Thanks, Amanda. John, I want to just quickly turn to you on your on your kind of aside about positive messages as an addition and evidence based, of course, positive messages in addition to the the all of the hard challenges that we face in addressing climate change. You want to pick up a little more on what you were talking about? Yes, uh, um, uh, I've been told through the experts I know in in engineering and process industries and so on that the the technologies exist to get to where we want to be, but it takes a commitment. So that's optimistic. We we actually could see a way to get there, okay? So we have to have the big drive and the commitment to do it. Uh, I think continual negativity is is not going to appeal to people has been mentioned before. So so I think you need a mix. You don't want to be, uh, uh, you know, in, in uh, la la land about it, but you still want to be, show that there's a lot of hope. I really am, am possible. I don't think any of us, well, Amanda might, but the four of us won't be seeing a whole lot of, of, the, of the change, but uh, I'm, I'm optimistic for my children and my grandchildren. I'm very optimistic. <laughs> Thank you, John. So um, hopefully we'll see a lot of change in the near term. I, you know, I think we can remain optimistic on that front as well. So, um, uh, you know, in the next panel, uh, folks will be diving uh, into these various pathways to action. Um, and Amanda, you spoke to the role of the Crossroads Initiative in identifying domains, areas that sort of fall between the cracks of where the current boards work and, and motivating action. And Marsha, you, you spoke to the role of carbon credits and, and carbon markets as, a, as an example of that, right? And I think it's a really interesting and important one. Um, let's take this opportunity to identify perhaps other areas 
substantive areas that you think um, might be ripe, that there, where the, the issues are not fully addressed or, or not well addressed at all, that the academies might distinctively um, contribute to um, addressing and bringing information to bear on solving problems uh, that don't currently fit within the domains identified by the boards. Anything you want to speak to um, as topics? Obviously, uh, Victor, you spoke to the Grand Challenges work. You want to take that? In a I don't want to take that on. Uh, for everyone of you who see a doctor, a nurse, a hospital, you should ask that question. Because after all, as I said, we contribute 8.5% of carbon emission of the country and 20% of GDP. It's, I mean, it's huge, right? And think about whether, uh, how the practice of medicine is affecting climate and environment in a big way. I mean, if you look at what's happened to us in terms of technology, it's unbelievable. US is bar none, right? But those technology, not always necessarily, uh, well, sometimes are needed, sometimes are not, and certainly they contribute a lot to carbon emission. Anesthesia gases, amazing quite a great source of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So the anesthesiologists now are talking about, well, let's convert more to intravenous eye uh, anesthesia, so things like that. But I think when you think about this whole area, how we practice medicine is really have great impact on the outcome of you individually, but also at the same time, if we can get a win-win, then you can look at reduction of decarbonization. So what am I talking about? Well, you know, um, during COVID, we went virtual. And uh, I think most people would agree that went quite well. I mean, there are many aspects that didn't go well, but you can see the need for transportation mm -hmm. and the need for clinics and a lot of testing, great, great reduce. But that's an important issue because after all, we want prevention, care at your home, your community, so why do we have to have you walk into the clinic every single time, right? So that's one example. Care pathways, there's so many things we do in treating whatever disease it is with a pathway. We now need to incorporate the thinking of, in fact, the, the, you know, what do we do in terms of carbon emission? So working in our collaborative, working along with, in fact, the head of Medicare, Medicaid Innovation, working along with uh, Don Berwick, who used to be the head of uh, CMS and a uh, terrific guy, as well as John Perlin, who's the head of Joint Commission. And together we're creating this kind of policy and ideas of what to incentivize health systems to actually reduce carbon emission. So you, many of you heard about value-based uh, care, which is looking at outcomes rather than encounters that started with uh, President Obama and is still moving on. So rather than looking at outcomes, uh, in addition to looking at outcomes, we can also measure what are we doing in terms of carbon emission? Are we also improving care? Are we making things more efficient? So a lot of redesign of the way we do care. I think that's the key message that I wanna tell you is because there's lots that can be done. 8.5, I mean, you can say, you know, the things that John not do is, amazing technology. I would say starting in fact, what we can do, what you want to do. Last point, if you think about going to a hospital, I get asked about my date of birth four times, as if, you know, <laughs> I said, look, I know it. They check my left hand, right hand, whole bit. You know, that all started with a report of Institute of Medicine 20 years ago called The Air's Human, where they demonstrated that there's medical errors that's happening in hospitals and of course, it took a long time to get the movement going, but Don Berg is one of the key individuals. And now, of course, you can't go to any hospital without saying that you're measuring outcome, safety, are you safe whole bit. I actually think that climate is the same situation. We're starting a journey now, we're successful, then I think all healthcare systems will have this into the equation, if you will, measuring the success of this, and it's good for everybody. And probably it will reduce cost as well. There's a lot of cost expensive ways of doing things in the medicine. And now, of course, this can greatly reduce the cost of care. Can I follow up on that thing? Sure. Yeah, that's a really good point that Victor's raising. You can do things better when we, when we uh, innovate and, and, uh, and, and find new ways of, of uh, achieving our goals. 
but I heard a, a comment by um, the founder of Tesla. Uh, it's not Elon Musk, it's the person who founded the company who, who uh, and sold to Elon. And he, he said, uh, you should sell electric cars because they're better than gasoline cars, not because they're going to help hmm. the climate, but the, we'll make better cars, electric cars. So that was a really good point that I think you raised. Uh, Marsha. Uh, so, so far this morning, the word equity hasn't come up yet. Oh, I did. I said equity. You said it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> because I'm, I'm very concerned um, about the issue of equity mm -hmm. as we move to a carbon-free future. Uh, and let me just give you uh, a quick example. On, on my home, I've got solar panels on the roof, and I've got batteries lining the walls of my garage. My electric bill per year is $50. I've got neighbors who are renting their home, so they can't put you know, panels on it. They're paying $250 a month for electricity. So, you know, I think we do have to worry about as we try to design and encourage this carbon free future to worry about equity. Both in terms of mitigation and, of course, in adaptation. And of course, you had right. power when other people yeah. did. Yeah. yeah, we did. Yeah. We did. Everyone else has no power. We didn't even know it had gone out. So, so I think in Marsha's point, I'm thinking about equity as having the opportunity for everybody, right? So the question in terms of she's been able to put solar panels and battery, can it be available to everybody? And there are lots of issues to be sure that's uh, difficult. She's talking about renting versus owning, having the resources to do this, right? Having the ability to, so I think we do need to address equity in a big way. Now our, what we call climate community network brings lift experience people in poor community to talk about the need for more equity. We bring strategic partners, including uh, HHS, EPA, to talk about, now they have a chance to listen to what people are saying, they can possibly find ways to help or make available to the, um, to the community. You know, there's the IRA, there's all those policy, there's grants and the whole bit. So I think we need to find a way to get to everybody to achieve equity. We just thank you, Victor. We we just have a, a few seconds left before we transition to a Q and A with the audience, um, both here and online. Any last comments folks want to make about their hopes for the Climate Crossroads initiatives, or to build up on the key equity point? Uh, just my quick comment is, we need to find the triple bottom line here, where it's good for American economically, it's good for the citizens of America and it's good for the planet. No small charge to Amanda. Uh, uh, we don't uh, the climate crossroads uh, initiative. I'm confident you can do that. <laughs> and I'm looking forward to the discussions over the next couple of days as, as, you, as we do, and no, no, no pressure. <laughs> um, so let's turn this now to uh, Q&A with the, with the audience. I believe there'll be some microphones. I'm not quite sure. Uh, yeah, there are microphones. Okay. Uh, and we may have questions coming in on Slido from uh, from online as well. So, uh, and if I want to ask people who uh, give questions, please introduce yourself and and keep your question brief so that we can um, get to as many as possible. Hi, uh, I'm Kathy Wotecki. I am um, currently the chair of the Division of Earth and Life Studies here at the Academies. And I can't tell you how excited I am about the initiative and us being here today. And the question that I have for you is, how do you see the interaction with the private sector in new and innovative ways? I'm curious to hear your thoughts. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, Amanda, we've, we've spent a lot of time talking to people in yeah. industry. So. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it's a really good question because that's it's not, uh, traditionally been our, you know, main uh, group that we interact with. Um, and so we've been having a number of conversations with folks in the private sector to understand how we might uh, support their 
um, their decision making needs. Um, and, and so, I, so I don't fully have the answer yet. I think this idea of an action collaborative is one that is a is is potential. So, which is something that you know Victor's been starting with the decarbonizing the health sector, where they brought together a coalition of the willing um, to work together on a problem of mutual interest. And I think that could be a really um, you know a productive way for us to work with the private sector. I think also roundtables where we're doing convening and creating a space for ongoing dialogue. Um, certainly in the decarbonization work that um, the, that pathway, there's a lot of interest in having an, a forum for those kinds of dialogues that need to take place between different parts of the private sector and um, academics and, and civil society and those who would be interested in the equity piece, et cetera. So I think some of those sort of convenings where we're all kind of working towards a particular area of shared interest is, is, is really- Victor, you want to pick up on this as well? Yeah, I think the uh, it's really important in my mind to get everybody engaged, especially private sector. Otherwise we'd be talking to ourselves. I think that when you look at private sector, there are th things they can do better some of them are reasons why we are where we are, and there are also solutions that they can contribute to. Let's take again health. Uh, in terms of emission of 8.5%, 70% are scope three. That means that that's the private sector. That is in fact supply chain, manufacturing, transportation. And if they don't be part of it, we can work all we want in the hospitals. We're only making a small impact. I think the good news, Kathy, is that certainly in my world, ESG is a very important issue for all companies and boards, not only for the right reason, but also for the employees and for the stock, uh, the, the stockholders. So I think ESG is a very good way to bring them in to participate in solutions, but also look at what they need to do to mitigate, et cetera. So I think at least for us, Private sector is a very important issue. All right, let's get some more questions in the mix. Do we have anybody on this side? We do. Please introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Letitia Grenier from the San. I just got to pick too tall for that. I'm Letitia Grenier from the San Francisco Estuary Institute. I run a group called the Resilient Landscapes Program. We work a lot on operationalizing science for climate resilience, and I wanted to bring up the issue of environmental justice and the conception that was offered here which is the traditional one that, you know, the environment harms people inequitably. And that makes sense based on the history of contamination. But I think we should also think about, especially with respect to climate, who benefits. We now know that the environment can be very beneficial to people in terms of mental and physical health, having access to nature and access to biodiverse complex nature. So I think I'd love to see if your convergence approach could include thinking about who is benefiting from the environment. Where can we put in urban greening for carbon sequestration, reducing urban heat island, improving human health outcomes, and also reducing stormwater contamination and flooding. So there's a lot that could be done that I just want to ask you to think about who's benefiting, not just who's being harmed. Thanks so much for that comment question. Anybody want to weigh in? Brief. I'll just jump in to say we, we held a, a workshop in the last year on the intersection of ecosystem management and public health. Um, and it was just really getting at exactly those those points that you're making that we really could think, um, uh, you know, a lot more deeply about how we're managing our our green spaces, our parks, our public, um, um, you know, uh, places, you know, where where we're our outdoor sort of shared goods, um, in a way that is both advancing the conservation goals and also thinking about the public health benefits in a way that thinks about equity. Um, anyway, I would recommend that, uh, the, the videos and the information from that are in a-, in a did, did you want to mention the golf research program too? Oh yeah, good idea. Like we also have a, a golf research program here at the National Academies, which is looking at, at all of these issues um, in, in, in as well. Um, I'm, I'm not, on the spot, I'm not sure I can list off all the great things that they're doing, but um, they do do a lot of work on community and ecosystems and health. Community, and engagement, and community uh, engagement with the, with the technology development as well. Yep, exactly. But yes, really good point. Thank you. Let's turn back to this side. Please ask your question. Carlos, 
Carlos Salinas with Keel and Bridges. I accompany the traditional authorities of the Copan or I uh, peoples in the Colombian Amazon. I thank all of you for your beautiful vision. Uh, I don't share as much of the optimism and uh, part of that is also from born from the experience we had with the pandemic. On the one hand, we did see uh, at the beginning uh, people able to shut down things that needed to be shut down. We went virtual. Beautiful things happened. People saw the sky again. It was great. Um, of course, there was an untold amount of death and suffering that was assailing. Um, yet, we all also saw that from the beginning towards the end, uh, this massive onslaught of deliberate mis misinformation uh, taking place. Um, I agree, too, that there's uh, uh, positive possibilities with ESG initiatives. And yet we also see in Congress an onslaught, a deliberate attack against any ESG, against any equity-focused approaches. So my, I would like uh, to ask you to comment on the saying that you cannot wake up someone that is pretending to be asleep. Um, how does that all relate to the challenge that we have? Because unfortunately, from my small perspective, it appears as if that the quest for power and the underlying amount of greed uh, is one of the biggest challenges we have. As uh, Mr. Uh, John, Dr. John pointed out, we know how to get there. We have the science, we have all the beautiful vision and approach, uh, and these climate webinars have been amazing, that's why I'm here. Um, how do we get there given these deep, deep challenges? Thank you. Victor. Uh, so I'll give it a try. I agree with you that uh, misinformation issues like this are something we must tackle at National Academies. You mentioned pandemic. Uh, I've been very involved with both US and globally on the pandemic issue. A lot of good things came out of it. It's not perfect. Billions of dollars, trillions of dollars spent, not just economic loss, in looking at how to make sure that people have access to testing, you know, uh, countermeasures, drugs, and vaccines. The mRNA vaccine that actually came out within a year, unheard of. So I do think there's a reason to be optimistic because science, if done right, can actually address a lot of issues. The mobilization because of a crisis, and that's why I keep on saying this is a crisis, for people to realize this, resulted in lots of activities, including US leading the pandemic fund, you name it, and billions of dollars raised for that reason. And then of course, people are finally coming together to say, let's make sure that we are much better prepared for the next time. So I'm optimistic in the sense that there, there is action. It's not all negative. But I recognize with you what you're saying in terms of complex polit geopolitical issues, and we just have to deal with it. But I would continue to say that good things have come out and good things will come out from this. Arsha? Yeah, uh, just one quick comment on this. I think one thing we need to do is really empower young people. The young people are so engaged in this issue and they're the ones that are looking at the longer time horizon. They're not looking at their next quarterly uh, results or whatever. They are actually looking at what is the future that they're going to inherit. So I think we need to get more power to young people. Can I just build on that? Any thoughts? I'm going to turn to Amanda now on engaging uh, uh, younger, uh, not just audiences, but experts and, and budding experts and thinking about the next generation in the context of the Crossroads Initiative? In our, in our collaborative, we actually deliberately include young people. We include them as citizen scientists. That is, they're out there in the community. Actually, there's a thing called the photo voice. They took pictures and whatever, post it to let people know about this. So the equity collaborative includes young people who, in fact, are involved with a whole collaborative 
and also enabling the research, the data that need to be collected. Yeah, yeah and uh, both sci we have a frontiers of science and frontiers of engineering program, very active programs that engage hundreds of younger with, you know, your definition of young has to come in here, but uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> younger than no, <laughs> younger we still don't part, don't. Stage, right? <laughs> but, but you know, and you know, the age of 40 and below, you know, so <laughs> those programs are very active and uh, those people, I think out of the box too, and they're, they're more optimistic, they're more optimistic. Uh, yeah. Amanda. Uh, I mean, as a parent myself, this is something that resonates with me a lot. Um, the, already we have programs that engage younger people. So I, I called attention to the New Voices program that works with a, young scholars and many of them are interested in climate change. They've actually, this, this um, cohort of New Voices what are they called fellows or, or um, have organized a climate group and they're, they're working together to do things on climate already, uh, self-organize that. Um, so, you know, I think, I think there's a lot that we could do to leverage that kind of interest further. Um, the other thing I might highlight is our, our board on science education has been thinking for a long time about doing work around um, how do you prepare um, civil society to make good decisions around climate. Um, so you know, climate education, not just about do you understand how the atmosphere works or the ocean works, but really how can you engage productively in the kinds of really hard decisions that we as a society are going to have to wrestle with. Yeah, and I think we've got precedents for this as well. Uh, many people here who might be of my generation, I remember when I was a kid, there was this big campaign against being a litter bug. And whoa, you didn't want to be a litter bug. Oh my God, um, you know, seeing trash by the roadway, no way. And then for my children, it was recycling. They did what it was, it was like, like um, a horror show if someone threw a can in the trash. We took a vacation to a state that didn't have curbside recycling. When we came back from that vacation, I was unpacking my children's luggage and they had filled their luggage with every can to bring it back to California so they could recycle it. <laughs> they can bring all the fossil fuel emissions back as well. That'd be really helpful. Uh, um, uh, let's, uh, uh, <laughs> let's get some more questions in the mix on this side, please. <laughs> Thanks for bringing it forward. Who wants to tackle these big questions? One hundred years. Uh, uh, We're going from one hundred to twenty-five. So, how can we accelerate the transition? I think the example would be uh, petroleum. We have to build all the gas station. I mean, when you really go from the beginning to to where everybody can drive, it's fifty to seventy-five years. I, um, uh, I I think that there's an emphasis now in engineering on on, on some expediency and speed in, in transitioning technologies. So, I think it's naturally. Uh, going to happen. But I think the key here is going to be electrification. And we do have a lot of experience in electrification. We have to uh, upgrade the grid and improve it and so on. <laughs> Definitely that, that's a key element, but we already have that in place. So I think we're, it's not going to be the same as introducing something totally new. I think it'll be a, 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 system, a systems improvement, let's say, that I hope would take less than 25 years. And we probably need faster incentives for shutting down. I mean, every time I hear about a coal-fired power plant being built, I'm really concerned because without incentives, that coal plant is going to run until it dies. Uh, for many decades. So, so, but let's. I think the question also, just to kind of pick up on it, was about what kind of the things the academies can do, right, in this context to accelerate the. That's of course the focus and part of one of the main 
pathways to action, but anything specific it's, in the academy's it's work? Roadmaps. We, we need to help by creating roadmaps, roadmaps for how to get from here to there. Yep. And convening groups of experts. I mean, the expertise is not within the academy necessarily, it's outside, but we, we bring those together in the convergence. And that's what Climate Crossroads is all about. I think. Yeah, I mean, I, I, th I think we can help by bringing together different groups of experts who might not otherwise interact yes. with each other to sort of um, accelerate the diffusion of knowledge or the sort of the insights that can emerge from those kinds of conversations. The other thing that comes to mind, and, and not just because Tom Dietz asked the question, but you know, I think we know a lot more um, now about um, behavior science, um, social science that we could be better bringing to the table around the um, this energy transition and the other kinds of transitions we need to make. Um, we we are going to have to ask people to change things about the way they live their day-to-day -day lives. And, and we need to bring to bear what those fields of science have learned about how people make decisions and take actions in a more um, deliberate kind of way. So I think that's another place where we could be kind of bringing that to the table better. Okay, thank you. Are there other questions, I think, on this side? Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Oh, thank you very much. I know we're running out of time, but I could not resist uh, to chime in on the youth aspect. Uh, my name is Leila McCurdy. Uh, one of my roles is um, serve as the chair of the Children's Environmental Health Committee of the American Public Health Association. And I wanted to raise the issue of um, you know the uh, of course climate change is a uh, the biggest public health challenge we're facing today and we need to act fast but there is also the aspect of mental health crisis and part of the among the youth children and youth and and part of that is echo anxiety as we all know. And um, and there are many things we can do uh, to deal with this, but one way is to educate them about climate change, empower them, and give them solutions they can help uh, resolve. Because as we all know, and we don't need to be mental health uh, experts to acknowledge that, I think people suffer more when they have no way to act on an issue. But if we empower kids, and you know, we talked about youth as an upper age group, I think, earlier. I'm talking about K-12 age group, where they are looking for answers and they are suffering uh, with mental health issues. The statistics are all there. So we need to engage them, empower them, and have them be able to take action to participate in uh, solving this crime, climate crisis. And we at the American Public Health Association created a um, uh, K-12 uh, education kit that can be easily uh, delivered by volunteers like yourself. Uh, you don't have to be an expert. Uh, you can offer your uh, help to schools because they are overburdened with so many things. And um, you know, um, get into the classroom or be part of after school activities to help these kids. Uh, Thank you. To Thank be you educated. for that. I'm gonna I'm gonna I really appreciate that intervention. And it's about making sure the academies can do work that provides agency uh, to a range of stakeholders, right? Kids, but of course, to other communities as well. We are we are out of time, but, but I want to- One more question over there, and I- If we have time, that'd be great, please. It would be nice to, yeah. Uh, great, uh, hi everyone. My name is Jason Toey. I'm a PhD student um, at Stanford, the door school there. Um, so a lot of my work focuses on looking at um, the climate impacts of health, and then also a sustainable energy transition. But one thing that I'm finding, as, especially as an early researcher, is there has not been a lot of interconnections um, between um, these different fields. So let's say I do climate in one say, so I work with climate scientists, and other times I'm working with public health professionals, medical doctors, and also energy modelers and things. And a lot of times there's 
And I feel like it's kind of hard to really come together and really make innovative change because even though my program itself is interdisciplinary, a lot of the people I work with might be more narrow. Um, so my question is kind of how can the academies really, and like I know we're here now, so this is a thing, but like how can the academies really um, work, especially at some of these academic institutions or other institutions of higher learning to really basically, I don't know, push people into being more receptive or appreciative of like doing this cross-disciplinary type work, especially um, for these types of issues. That's a great question. Let's let's uh, pick up on it and then we'll have to turn to a close. So yeah. Marcia. Let me just make a quick statement. We have to deal with the academic incentive system because right now, if someone wants to be hired or promoted or tenured, um, it is an entirely disciplinary approach. And that discourages people from working in the way that you suggest. Uh, first, I agree with Marsha. Uh, we've learned this and being academic all my life about the need to get incentives and rewards. But also leadership counts because I know of places where the entire university is into this space. Uh, take USC, Carrefour, and it goes all the way down to the medical school, the engineering school, et cetera, and bring them all together. There are quite a few examples like this. And I think that's the opportunity to bring many differences together. So incentives and also leadership. Yeah, uh, well, I spent 48 years in the academic environment. Uh, and I think there's, there's something to be said for what the questioner said. Uh, the, but there are some experiments in some universities that uh, have gone beyond the traditional department uh, uh, designation. And uh, I was at one of them where you could have, uh, you had an appointment in two different colleges. So, and that's doable and tenure was doable uh, at, at that university. So it's a cultural change, but if you have someone who's, who's uh, uh, paid, I'm not talking about just a courtesy appointment, actually paid by two separate departments or two separate colleges, uh, you, you will get interdisciplinary work. And those people were very, very productive. It's fascinating. It's a great question. I would just say that the academies are uniquely well positioned to inform, perhaps make recommendations on changes to the culture and incentive system precisely to support the presidents of universities can't even change things. Yeah. Uh, 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 but but one has to one has to work and the academies are kind of a, a unique opportunity to to build that out. So uh, with that, we're going to have to close this session. Um, if you didn't have a chance to put an idea or question forward, please make sure to add them to Slido. I think we'll have the QR code on the screen. If not now, then we'll have it again later. Um, we'll read them all and perhaps pick them up again in future discussions. So for now, let me thank our panelists. Thank all of you for submitting questions. This is just uh, the beginning. We're gonna take a short break now and return, I believe at 1045 Eastern time uh, for the next panel on Pathways to Action. So thank you all. Thank you.